Okay, so today we are going to be reviewing Malazan, book one, Gardens of the Moon. Okay, I loved it. We're gonna do spoiler free and then we're gonna do spoiler and it's gonna be messy. <laughs> I finished this book I think two days ago and for two days I've been trying very hard to collect my thoughts and they are still not collected. I don't it's gonna be a mess. The review is gonna be a mess. But we're gonna do spoiler free first for those of you who just want general idea of what I thought about this book. And the answer is I loved it. I loved it so much. I enjoyed reading it pretty much from page one to page, what, 650 something. I enjoyed it so much. There was a, there was a chunk in the middle that I did find a little bit boring. That's all. <laughs> um, it, okay, I don't know much about this series. I am not very connected with Malazan fans. I am friends with Brittany, whose channel will be linked down below. She loves the series and I am a, I've recently started connecting with Andy Smith, also will be linked down below. Um, but uh, neither one of them have talked to me about this series at all. So I am, not connected with the series. All I've ever heard is, this is overwhelming, you'll probably bail. <laughs> and yeah, it's overwhelming, but I am so excited for book two. Okay, so I guess let me real quick uh, mention that this is technically a reread. When I, it was like two years ago, I think, when I was still early on in reading Wheel of Time, I was still getting into the Wheel of Time series, I decided to pick up Malazan too, And that was a mistake. Uh, so really quickly, I realized that trying to get my head wrapped around the massive character cast and the massive world and history and everything going on inside of Wheel of Time, and then also picking up Malazan and trying to get my head wrapped around that was impossible. I was, it was too much for me. I mean, maybe not impossible. You might do it. I couldn't. So I dropped Malazan because I wasn't as far into that series. And honestly, my brain just dumped it. Reading this now felt like a first time read. The only thing that I could remember from my first read is feeling like the book felt very jagged. I remember saying, it just feels so jagged the way it's told. And I stand by that. I can articulate it a little bit better now. I stand by that. Doesn't change the fact that I loved it. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this. So. Malazan <laughs> is a really, it's a book where you're dumped in the world and you go. Uh, most modern fantasy authors want to give you some understanding of the world that they've created. Erickson really doesn't care about that. <laughs> he just, he expects you to figure it out while you go, which is not my preferred. I really don't mind exposition. I appreciate when authors try to help me understand things before we start running. Yes, I was disoriented and a little bit overwhelmed entering this world. That's absolutely true. But Erickson did a phenomenal job of creating so much intrigue around everything that was happening and every one that I was encountering that I couldn't, I, yes, I was overwhelmed, but I, it wasn't a frustrated overwhelmed. I wasn't irritated and, and, and angry about not understanding things. I was so interested in what I did understand that I wanted to keep reading fervently so that I could get more pieces of the puzzle so that I could understand. And I just think that's brilliant. I just think he did such a good job of putting me in a situation that was uncomfortable, but making me so interested that I have to keep going. Not only that, but I'm a very character reader, if you didn't know, and I loved these characters so much. I Ev almost every character that I encountered, especially there at the beginning, I thought was so interesting. I, I loved following them and I was so attached to them in this book. That's actually one thing that Andy has said is that it's hard to attach the characters in the first book because there's so many different POVs that we're balancing. And I just don't agree with that. <laughs> I was so attached to them because they were so interesting. Um, but, but 
it is disorienting, it is overwhelming. There's a lot of things, very interesting things, some general setup things like the fact that there's a moon in a city on top of the moon. I don't really know what that looks like. I don't fully, I can't fully wrap my head around a lot of the world. There's, there's gods walking on earth and each wad got, each god has its own house and, and there's, there's people, representatives of the house, people who have different roles and some gods are two sides of one thing and there are these things called warrens that are essentially, should I say that in the spoiler free? There's a lot going on and very little of it is upfront explained. You just have to keep going and try to piece it together. And it is overwhelming and a lot of it I have not pieced together yet. There were scenes that I came out of with enough intrigue that I'm desperately trying to hold on to it in my mind. And then by the end of the book, it comes around and it explains itself very well and, and it's so satisfying. But then there are other things that I still have no idea what happened. I mean, there were scenes that I walked out of thinking, I don't know what happened here. <laughs> but for the most part, even though I was disoriented, I loved it so much. And I, I still think, especially especially the first half of the book, it, it, it did still read a little bit jagged. It read like, like a series of small things that are kind of being strung together. And then the second half of the book <laughs> is when everything explodes and you really try to keep up and sometimes it's very hard to keep up. There's just so much happening in this world and it's not explained a lot in this book. Uh, and I don't understand it, but I love it. It, it is a book that uh, needs to be read carefully because a lot of things are just thrown out there, just mentioned and it's relevant and it's important but Erickson is not going to spoon feed it to you. He's not gonna beat you over the head with it. Like every sentence you need to pay attention to because it could potentially be something very meaningful, which I like, even though I happily and readily admit I'm not smart enough for this book. So much of it went over my head. I, the stuff that didn't was excellent. Okay. Well, the spoiler free was supposed to be more structured and composed than spoiler. So this should be fun. I'm going to dive into spoilers and then hopefully come back to you with my final thoughts uh, that are a little bit better. <laughs> so time st stamps in the description. If you haven't read this book yet and you don't want to be spoiled, skip to final thoughts. Spoilers. I, <laughs> okay, listen. This story and this world, a lot of stuff is still just kind of hanging over my head, a lot of puzzle pieces that I still don't know where they go. I still don't know how to place them. I still, there's still huge gaps of this book that still feel very fuzzy to me. So I apologize for how discombobulated I am. But I guess what I'm gonna do, because this book, <laughs> There's so much that happens in this book and a lot of really complicated things that I can't give you a blow by blow or even like main events kind of discussion on this. Uh, had I known what I was getting into, which I know this is a reread, I should have known, but I'm telling you, I dumped the information of this book when I decided to temporarily DNF the series because I was just trying to grasp, I was just trying to wrap my head around Wheel of Time at the time. So had I known what I was getting into, I might have tried to do this section by section, but that's not what I did. I read the book and now here I am. So I'm just gonna talk to you about some of my favorite characters and then we're gonna talk about some of my favorite scenes. And then we're gonna talk about some things that I didn't like. Actually, before I jump into characters that I love, I need to start on chapter one because I don't know how you can read chapter one and not instantly be invested in this story. Yes, the prologue was confusing and it didn't really do much for me, but chapter one, we have a witch who can steal souls, put them in candles and burn them, who gives Sori, sorry, a prophecy that uh, basically says, okay, listen, it basically says you and I are connected 
even though this is the last time you're gonna see me and you're the last person who's going to see me, we're not done here. I mean, that's basically what this prophecy said. I guess I could try to find it and read it to you, but I don't really want to. That's what I got from it. There's hundreds of bodies strewn about this town. We go into, every house is filled with bodies, but we go into one house that doesn't have bodies and it's filled with candles and that's, that's the witch. But the witch is dead. I know she's not dead, or I know we're not done with her. First of all, that's way too interesting of a beginning to just have to add intrigue and then kill off the witch. No, I don't believe you. There's something more for her. But then the prophecy that she gives to Sori, I didn't expect her to be inside of Sori later on, but I knew we weren't done with her. And how do you read? Okay, first of all, Erickson's prose, I quite like. <laughs> I think, I'm gonna say something and you're gonna disagree with me and I'm not gonna be able to justify it. I, I compare Erickson's prose to uh, Abercrombie's prose, Joe Abercrombie. Now, I know it doesn't make sense and I'm sorry, but here's why. Because, not because their prose in general are the same, but because the way they describe horrific acts, horrific um, scenes. Both authors, here's what I usually see. I either see uh, an author trying to write grim, grim Dark and bashing you over the head with it and like shoving it down your throat and not letting you forget it, or I see an author writing Grim Dark but also explaining morality to you, trying to trying to show you how the author feels about what they've just written. Does that make sense? And both Abercrombie and Erickson write these scenes in a way that is detached yet packs the punch. And what I mean by that is, is that it's described bluntly without inserting morality. So I'm given this situation, I'm given this scene in a very blunt and honest and brutal way without bashing me over the head with it. And then I'm left there and I'm left to decide how I feel about it. And that, I love it. I love it. So anyway, what? Moving on. So not only, sure, I'm disoriented, but there's this awesome character that has this incredibly cool magic with taking people's souls and putting in candles and burning the candle. That's interest, instant intrigue into this world that we're in and the magic that I'm in store for. And it's just casually mentioned, just thrown out there for me to say, what now? And then this and then this battle and this terrible scene followed by, a, well not followed by, and then we're left to remember this prophecy that pretty much promises us we're not done. This wasn't just, this wasn't just a uh, reader bait. This wasn't just, hey reader, look at this interesting start to the book. Don't you want to keep going? No, it actually matters. I know it does. Okay, sorry. I really liked the first chapter. <laughs> Instantly, interest, in, instantly interested. I love Sori. I love her character from the very beginning. I think that she has such an interesting personality. She was easy for me to latch onto. Um, the more I get to know her, the more I get to know what's going on with her internally. I want to keep peeling back her layers. I'm so interested in her. And then the fact, oh, <laughs> that scene early on, what was it, chapter four, when Perrin goes into goes into the camp and says uh what was his line something like um if you kill me it better be for a good reason or something like that and then he sits down and plays cards with them and then leaves and then sorry kills him by stabbing him in the chest oh i love her character i love her character so much um so then we have this sort of thing that happens to her halfway through where she becomes absalon and her character does drop off a little bit for me after she becomes Absalon. Unfortunately, I expect great things from her. I don't think we're done with her. I think that she's a character that I really love and I expect to keep loving her, even though even though she did, did lose me in the second half after she becomes Absalon. Um, I don't know. I still expect great things from her. I better get great things from her. <laughs> Who else? Who else can I talk about? Tattersail is another character that I was instantly attached to. So what is it called? The Deck of Dragons. So I don't know. 
I, the visual of what the deck of dragons is, what it does, how it's connected to the gods and what the gods are doing. So it, it kind of changes itself, right? Like new cards will appear that have never been seen before because the deck itself is connected to the world, right? So Tattersail is constantly in the beginning giving these prophecies and giving these, and man, I just want, after I finish the series, I just wanna go back to book one and read all of her prophecies and try to figure out what they all meant. Do you know, oh, just so much intrigue in that character from the very beginning creates so much intrigue for this world and for what's to come. Every scene she's in, I'm fascinated by her. Also, didn't she carry around after her friends with benefits lover thing, after he died, didn't she carry around his battered and in pieces corpse while it was rotting? She carried around his rotting corpse in her bag. That's weird. You did a weird thing. Um, sorry, I told you this would be all over the place. Uh, then Tattersail dies. She opens a warren, which was an excellent scene. She opens a warren, she's burned to death. And then Krapa, uh, which I, Krapa, Krupa, Krup, um, I mostly read this physically, but I did listen to a few chapters in the beginning on audio and that was what the narrator called him. So that's what I'm going with, even though it doesn't make sense for the spelling. Um, but I switched to physical because the series is hard to keep up with in audio. But anyway, Krapa, he has that dream and Krapa's dreams clearly are something, you know, it's not just a dream. Obviously there, there's something very significant about his dreams. I can't tell yet if his dreams are, are like prophecies, like bringing things into life. Does that make sense? But they clearly are, or, or are they just visions? where he's just seeing things happening that he shouldn't be able to see physically because he's not there physically, but he can just see things. I can't tell, but those are my theory. He's either, he's either see visions, his dreams are visions or his dreams are creating things. I don't know yet, but they're clearly not just dreams. Anyway, he has this dream, I'm so sorry. He has this dream of Tattersail her spirit is inserted into a pregnant woman and then she's birthed and now she's like that demonic twilight baby that grows at a rapid pace. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> there were so many scenes in this book that I came away just thinking, what did I just read? But I'm fine with it. I mean, I'm fine with it because it's established really early on in the book that a physical death doesn't mean a death in this world, right? So it's not a fake out death. It's not a lie. It's not a resurrection. It, it's, it's lore of the world established from the first chapter, really, if you think about it. The witch that can steal souls and burn them in a candle. We know souls. We know that the body and the soul are two separate entities, right? And then we have Perrin who dies in like chapter four, I think. And he, go <sighs> that scene was actually very confusing to me. But he goes and he speaks with those two gods that are kind of two parts of one thing, like luck and, un and, and unluckiness. And they are arguing over him and then the hounds. And anyway, the point is Perrin's soul returns. Oh, and then we also have um, Night, oh shoot, what was his, Night Hair? I don't remember his name now. The puppet, the wizard turned puppet. His soul is is taken and put inside a marionette which is the coolest thing ever. It's literally one of my favorite parts of this book. And when he died, I died. So anyway, oh, and, and the puppet guy tries to steal souls at one point in the book. So we know very early on, we, it's established that souls are separate, are separate from the body. So just because we have a physical death doesn't mean that the character is done, right? So I'm, f <laughs> I'm fine with Tattersail with whatever is going on with her, even though I don't get it at all. And it's weird. I'm cool with it. I actually kind of like this lore in this, in this world because it adds a level of intrigue. As far as I can tell, Erickson isn't breaking his own rules. He's not doing stuff just for the gags. He's not killing someone and then chickening out and resurrecting them. You know what I mean? I, 
I like what he's doing. He establishes early on the soul is a separate entity from the body. And then pretty early after that with Perrin, he establishes the soul just because the body is dead, does the soul can be moved. Well, with Perrin and with the puppet guy, the soul can be moved around and the soul, you know what I mean? So I'm fine with what's happening with Tattersail. I just don't understand it. Um, but I am, th I'm thrilled that she's not dead, dead and <laughs> whatever's going on with her, with her rapidly aging childness. Um, I, I'm thrilled that we get more of her in some capacity in later books. I also really like Perrin. I keep mentioning him without properly talking about him, but I think that his um, entire arc in this book and, and the backstory that we have on him, I think is really fascinating. I'm gonna try to blow through these now here, here because I'm realizing how much time I'm spending on each character. But I think Perrin's entire, everything that we've learned about Perrin so far and what we've gotten from him in this book has been fascinating. I'm thrilled to keep following him. Whiskey Jack is another character that I'm, instantly pretty interested in. Um, I never did learn how to say his name. Adir Adirand Ad Adirander Brake. I don't know how to say his name. He's a character that is fascinating to me. I still, after reading an entire book, I still can't really tell if he's gonna be, which side he's gonna be on. Is he going to be a good guy or is he going to be an antagonist. Either way, he's powerful, he's fascinating, and I like every scene he's in. Uh, oh, and Crocus. I know I shouldn't love Crocus, he's a mess, but I do. Uh, I liked him from Croppa's very first dream sequence with him. I think that he is, I think that he's, he, I don't know, he's just a dum-dum, and I kind of love him for it, you know? Like, I like, I like his sequences when he's being a spy, his, his infatuation with Chalice is, at first, it's like, aw, sweet kid, you don't know what you're doing. And then, after he kidnaps her, it's like, aw, Crocus, why are you so stupid? But I guess you could say that a lot with him because pretty much everything he thinks or plans out doesn't pan out. He's just, there's so many characters in this series that you think, you think one thing and then it's revealed that they actually have a master plan. They actually know a lot more than you, except for Crocus. You think maybe he understands more and then it's revealed, no, he's just a dum-dum. But I kind of love him. I don't know, I'm very attached to him. And like I mentioned before, I was very, very invested in Puppet. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, something hair. Night hair? Anyway, I was very, very invested in him. Not, I mean, he's a terrible character, but I, or he's a terrible person, I should say, but I liked being horrified by him in every single scene he showed up in. Plus the fact that he lived between Warrens in chaos and and that he was becoming more and more unhinged and every scene we got from him, he was just so creepy and disturbing and uncomfortable. And when he tried to steal that one guy's soul, when Tattersail stopped him, like that was a horrifying scene. And I just like being terrified by him and I'm disappointed that I can't anymore. Oh no, this is a mess. Okay, couple of scenes that I really liked. <laughs> Even though I've already talked about several scenes that I liked. I love the bridge burners. Uh, I really like the scenes, all the scenes that they have together, but I especially loved when they just like went into the streets and started tearing up the stones of the streets to bury landmines, just plain sight. I love it so much. Um, I really like the scene, even though I didn't understand it, when Perrin touched the blood and then was transported to another realm, maybe, where you had these creatures, these humanoid-like creatures chained to the thing that they were pulling. I don't really understand what happened there, but the visuals of it, I was so into, and I would like to understand it more. I think, I think really, as far as like, as far as, it's, it's so hard for me to discuss this book because there are so many things that happen that I'm so intrigued by, but I don't fully understand because the lore of the world is still kind of just out there for me. And I'm, I'm trying to pull at the threads to be able to piece it together. And I haven't yet, but there's so many things that happen like that parent scene that are just instantly so fascinating to me. And I want more of that, even though I don't, I can't really explain to you exactly what happened there. 
Uh, I also want to say, I, I need to talk about the final battle, but I don't know how to talk about the final battle. Because um, it was so interesting, but also so chaotic that there was a lot that was, <clears throat> I don't really know how to break it down really. And some of it I didn't understand. But uh, I, I love dragon fights in any book, but I think Erickson writes dragon fights phenomenally. And I enjoyed every moment that we got of it. Um, the fact that characters are shapeshifters and can turn into dragons, yes, absolutely yes. Every time we got that, we had like four black dragons, right? And the black ones are the shapeshifters, yeah? So, I don't know. <laughs> it's just so interesting. You have real dragons that are fighting. You have shapeshifters, people who are turning into dragons. I don't understand it all. I can't, I can't even recap it well because I'm still very overwhelmed by it all. But I can tell you that I loved it. It was so much fun to read. Now, some things that didn't, did, I didn't love as much in the final battle. Actually, when I finished Gardens of the Moon, I posted on Instagram that I finished it and I got a DM saying that they hated, somebody hated the ending of the book because it felt like Erickson was just rolling dice to see what would happen. And then he just put it in the book, whether it made sense or not. <clears throat> and frankly, I think that's fair. I, I think that that's a good way of describing some of the events that happened. We have uh, that acorn that was planted in a very convenient place, even though she can't have understood what the acorn was capable of. We had those vines that randomly came out of the wall and killed some people for us. There were things at the end that it just felt like, okay, all right, and I just kind of had to go with, which I don't love, but I also wonder how much of that is just because I couldn't keep up with absolutely everything that was happening. Anyway, that was really rambly. <laughs> Listen, this, I enjoyed this book so much, but there's so much of it that I can't fully piece all of it together. I can't piece all the things that happened together in some cohesive discussion. But I really, really liked it. Final thoughts. I under this is an overwhelming book and I understand why it wouldn't be for everybody. But I think that there was so much intrigue that made me want to under things, understand things that I couldn't understand. And there's so many satisfying things. I guess I didn't talk about this in the spoiler section, but that's fine. There were things that happened at the beginning of the book that seemed very confusing that by the end they were, it was revealed and it all came around in a really satisfying way. I don't know. It is an overwhelming book. There's so many characters mentioned. There's so many perspectives that we, that we flip back and forth between. And there's so much greater lore and world that's happening that I still can't piece together fully, but I have enough information that I'm fascinated by it all and I desperately want to keep going to understand it more. Now I have heard that book two is in, it follows different characters. It's in another country, I believe, and follows a whole new cast of characters, which normally I would hate, but I'm actually really glad for because that means that I can spend more time in this world and I can understand this world a bit better so that maybe I can catch up and feel like I have a more firm foundation before we get back to all these characters that I'm already really attached to. And this way, when I see them again, maybe I'll be more on their level so that I don't get left behind. <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, I don't know. Honestly, I'm just excited for more. I just really, really liked it. Uh, I'm going to be reading it slowly uh, I'm going to take it, I, I, I read this a little bit probably faster than I needed to because I was so into it that I just wanted to keep consuming it. And I think that I, if I had read it more slowly, I maybe could have even picked up more and be a little bit less overwhelmed. So I'm gonna to try to really force myself to take my time on book two and not just gobble it up uh, because I want to understand it as best I can because it is a very large, large, large world. Okay, I've been talking for a long time. I really enjoy Gardens of the Moon. I hope that this review was acceptable. It, 
It was a mess. I'm a mess after reading this book, but I loved it and I bring on Dead House Gates. Anyway, thanks, thanks for chatting with me. Um, I post videos every Tuesday through Friday. Check out my Patreon if you feel like it. Be sure to chat with me more about all this in the comments. Uh, if you're gonna talk spoilers, do the spoiler space, space, space thing. Please don't spoil me for later books, but feel free to clarify stuff that I messed up or misunderstood. I post videos every Tuesday through Friday. I'll see you again soon. Bye.